Astroworld, the wonderful world of fun, lives up to expectations. It is truly delightful family entertainment with a few new twists all its own. On June 1st, 1968, just before 10 a.m., Judge Roy Hoffines unlocked his newest creation, Astroworld. Five of his grandchildren threw an electric switch, starting the rise and releasing 2,000 balloons. Within two hours, 5,000 people had flooded into the park. 14 of the 16 rides were ready for opening day. The Alpine sleigh was not one of them, not having been tested yet, and Mill Pond suffered a mechanical failure, along with two of its passenger cars arriving late. Still, by the end of the day, 23,406 people had passed through the gates. Some people enjoyed the park, noting the bright colors and calling it a colorful spot for amusement, but others weren't as impressed. One of those was Jerry Flemons of the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. He noticed how the price estimate of the park fell over time, 20 million to 15 million, and the finished product was 10 million. It is almost as though the judge put a price tag on imagination. It shows, and the public is the loser again. He also accused Astroworld of being too similar to Six Flags Over Texas, but admits it's not a sin to copy success. Just that Astroworld is a poor imitation of Six Flags, and Six Flags' status as the number one tourist attraction in Texas is in no danger from Astroworld. Critics were not the only problem the judge would have to deal with. The Astroworld plot was famously a mosquito-riddled swampland before it was redeveloped, and less than a month after opening day, guests were complaining the drainage was so bad the park was turning into a swamp. The shows also took a major turn after just three weeks of operation, getting rid of guns from their western shows and the Bonnie and Clyde routine at the Crystal Palace. Park General Manager Stan McIlvaney said, The action was taken to help de-emphasize violence in America in some way, promoting nonviolence by eliminating unnecessary displays of violence. 1968 was a tumultuous year in America, Martin Luther King having been assassinated just two months prior, and the tipping point for park management may have been the assassination of Robert Kennedy, happening less than a week after the park opened. The gunfight show in the Western Junction was replaced by a 12-minute Medicine Man show, Astroworld being the first entertainment center to take action like this. Judge Hoffines also used the Astros as a promotion for the park, making four September home games Astroworld specials, giving anyone who bought a ticket to the game $1 off admission to the park. As the summer ended and the park went to weekend-only operation, Hoffines opened the park on Friday nights to feature new shows, trying to draw in teenage date-night groups, saying that Astroworld had the finest date-night type of entertainment facilities. September was also when the judges' Astroworld Motor Hotel Complex began to materialize, the Sheridan Inn opening its doors for the first time, the Howard Johnson to follow in October, the Holiday Inn in November, and finally, the flagship hotel, the 500-room Astroworld Motor Hotel completing the biggest single hotel operation in the city of Houston. By the end of its first year, the park was featured in the small screen, not once, but twice. First, there was a 28-minute documentary called Astroworld, The Wonderful World of Fun, tracing the park from its origins to its opening day. Then, there was The Pied Piper of Astroworld, a one-hour special to be aired on ABC, starring Soupy Sales and the Muppets. The filming of this movie would shut the park down for a week in December. Afterward, Soupy Sales didn't seem impressed, when he was told that Astroworld was Roy Hoffines' answer to Disneyland, he replied, If that's his answer, I'd love to know what the question was. The judge's son also made headlines by announcing his departure from Astro Enterprises. Fred Hoffines had been a major partner in the Astro domain, but he expressed his regret and said he wanted to explore new opportunities, and he could no longer be part of his father's ventures. Ultimately, the park's first year wasn't great, but it was far from a disaster. They drew over 1 million guests, but they were projecting 1.6 million. Park spokesman Wayne Chandler citing 37 days of rain as a major problem. That included 10 days in a row during the park's opening month. Still, they were expecting 1.5 million people to come into the park in 1969. When asked if Astroworld was similar to Disneyland, the judge replied, It has the basic design format of Disneyland, and we plan to expand the park each year, as did Disney. 1969 would see $1 million in new attractions, including a 300-seat expansion of the Astro Go Go Theater, a new circus tent in Children's World, new scenes on the 610 Limited Train and Lost World Adventure, and doubling capacity on the Alpine Sleighs by tying two cars together. More significant, they added a renovated carousel from the turn of the century, known as the Denzel Carousel, named after the manufacturer. This would be under a 65-foot dome with a 13-foot arch. 
They also added an aerodynamics log flume called Bamboo Shoot, and the park's first coaster, an aerodynamics junior coaster called Serpent. This would be one of their mini mine train models, the same one opening at Six Flags Over Texas and Six Flags Over Georgia that year. These new attractions in the Oriental Corner, plus the 4 million people that came to the Astrodome every year, plus the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey acts at the Astro Hall, this made the judge optimistic for the future, and he expressed his desire to expand Astroworld from 57 to 116 acres, as well as expand his hotel complex from 4 to 9 hotels. The all-in-one Astro Domain vacation was a dream that he was pushing hard, as he introduced a $10 combo ticket, getting into an Astro game, entry into Astro World, a reserved seat to the circus, a tour of the Astrodome, and a souvenir book. Astro World's second season kicked off with another push to hire a thousand employees, putting out a flyer for attractive, well-groomed, enthusiastic young people. They were also looking for college-age entertainers, including singers, dancers, banjo players, and specialty acts, all invited to come audition at the Astro World Hotel. They would try and join the Music Merchants, the Barbershop Quartet performing on Memory Lane, as well as the Crystal Palace Singers. They had just won a nationally televised talent show. These entertainers would be placed in every section of the park, putting on some kind of show or act pretty much the entire operating day. But they would not be working for General Manager Stan McElvaney. He resigned his post after just two years. Having seen both his son and his GM depart the company, Judge Hoffines was still heads down and moving forward. At this point, he'd invested $40 million into the Astro Domain, with the stated goal of establishing Houston as a tourist city. On August 3, 1969, Astroworld had its first major incident involving park gas. One of the sides of Astro Wheel came crashing to the ground. Witnesses estimated it was between 10 and 12 feet. Nobody was seriously injured, but 17 people were sent to the hospital. The crash also caused the second wheel to jam, trapping its riders at the top of the cycle, the fire department having to come and rescue the 31 riders. While the rides were having problems, the shows were as popular as ever. A survey showed the Crystal Palace was the top-rated attraction, followed by the Trinidad Syncopators, the Glass Blower, Over the Border Brass, the Medicine Man Show, and the Barnyard. For the fall, they introduced a new musical called Way Out West. The new general manager was Gene Patrick, and he described it as by far the best thing we've ever done. This got rave reviews. With a strong lineup of entertainment, Astroworld wanted to use the 1970 season to improve their ride collection. They would introduce their first thrill coaster, a chance rides toboggan called Swamp Buggy. This would be themed as a giant swamp tree, the car being lifted vertically inside of the tree and spiraling down, located on the new Fun Island in the middle of the park. Fun Island would also be home to the Wacky Shack, a tilted illusion house that uses angles to give the appearance of defying gravity. There would also be Barrel O Fun, a rotor ride, spinning so fast that it pins its riders to the wall while the floor drops to the ground. For the families, a seal pool was added to Children's World. They would also replace the wonderful World of Fun slogan with a new one, We Make People Happy. Gene Patrick was projecting more than 1 million visitors for the year, and they were looking for any new angle to boost attendance. In May, the park was rented out by the Southern Gas Association, inviting 2,000 guests. It was the first time that Astroworld had hosted a private party, something that Gene Patrick was inviting companies to do. He wanted more private parties on weekdays in the spring and fall when the park was closed. All of their efforts paid off in 1970, as the park set a record by drawing in over 100,000 guests in one weekend in August. Passing the 1 million mark by the end of the month, they would end up with 1.2 million. The 1 millionth visitor was Jimmy Johnson, and his whole family was given season passes, as well as an all-expense-paid weekend at the Astroworld Hotel. Gene Patrick had done well in his short time as general manager, but he decided to move on to work for a new firm building a new park in Charlotte, North Carolina. Judge Hoffines praised him for the tremendous job he has done in bringing the park to its present state of excellence. Hoffines would replace him with George Lanier Jr., an Astro Domain executive, and said that he should be able to make Astroworld an attraction worthy of 2 to 4 million persons a year. The judge, now 58 years old, had suffered a stroke in May of 1970, leaving him partially paralyzed on his left side. At this point, he decided to consolidate all his properties under the Astro Domain Corporation. This would include four subsidiaries, the Hoffines family being sole owner of each. But he appointed one man to be the new CEO, president, and chairman of the board, fellow Houston businessman Ruben W. Askenas. Rumors started swirling late in the year that the Astro Domain was for sale, but the judge denied it. He still had the drive to run his company. His 16-hour days cut down to 12, using the rest of his time for physical therapy. His nurses saying his speech was flawless, and he was showing tremendous progress, months ahead of what was expected. But in the end, he would be confined to a wheelchair. Hoffines admitted the Astro Domain was touch and go financially over the last five years, but the lender stayed with him and he felt like they turned the corner. 
We have done only about one quarter of what we plan to develop at Astro Domain. What we need to do is keep moving. Because of our operation record, we can raise money for whatever we want to do here. But there were other factors threatening Hoffpines' empire. Bush Gardens had opened up a brand new park in early 1971, right next to the Bush Brewery in Houston, 15 miles from Astroworld. This was a 40-acre park that had an Asian theme, animals, a boat ride, a railway, and it had the size and promise, but it proved to be unprofitable and closed down in 1973. On top of that, Senator Charles Wilson proposed a 10% entertainment tax, stating, I basically like the tax things people can do without. Hoffines and his attorneys fought against it, saying it would reduce attendance at Astros games and put Astroworld further in financial danger, citing competition from parks opening in Louisiana and Walt Disney's new venture in Florida. Still, 1971 was poised to be the park's best year, expecting 1.5 million guests once again, and they set a single-day record of almost 20,000 people on Saturday, May 15th. The big addition for the year was the Orbiter, a retheme of their scramble ride, The Happening, enclosing it and adding effects. The Astro Wheel would be back in operation after his accident in 1970. They would also extend their hours to 11 p.m. six days a week and midnight on Saturdays. New shows were planned for the Lagoon Pavilion, a stage right in the water, and a new show at the Crystal Palace called Salute to Baseball, featuring a replica of the exploding Astrodome scoreboard. Just four years into its tenure, Astroworld had become one of the South's biggest producers of live shows. Seven live bands were scattered around the nine areas of the park, and the Crystal Palace was putting on 67 performances every week. Muhammad Ali even enjoyed a day at the park before a fight he had at the Astrodome. True to the judge's word, by the start of 1972, Astroworld announced a brand new area of the park, spanning five acres, a $1.5 million expansion called the Country Fair, the park's 10th themed area. This would take guests back to the era between 1880 and 1910, and it would be the first time the park expanded outside the 610 limited railroad tracks. But while this announcement was being celebrated, tragedy struck the park once again. On March 30th, a 49-year-old woman was killed on the Orbiter. The newly enclosed ride meant the guests would be looking for their seats in the dark. Being the first day of the park's operation, it was also the ride operator's first day, and the ride started while the woman was looking for a seat. Police said it would have been hard for the operator to see what was going on once the lights were dimmed. This was the first time a guest had been killed at the park. The park said there was no negligence by the operator, no equipment malfunction. It was just a very unfortunate accident. But that didn't stop a $765,000 lawsuit by the family against the park. The ride would remain open. As the summer rolled in, the country fair was finally open, the headline attraction being Dexter Freebish's electric roller ride, an aero development mine train, standing 80 feet tall and covering 2,900 feet of track. This ride and the park would be promoted later in the summer, as Houston DJ Jim Tate set a new world record by riding it 501 times in 24 hours. This beat the previous record of 465 rides set in 1968. The area also consisted of a Nickelodeon building, depicting the history of the automobile, also a silent theater showing some of the classic silent films from the early 1900s, an arcade music box pavilion, and a one-of-a-kind 1907 mirrored carousel, relocated to Astroworld from a country fair in Hanover, Pennsylvania. With a new themed area came the park's first price increase, now $5.50 for adults and $4 for children. But for the kids, the park would unveil a new mascot, Marvel McVay, the ambassador of happiness. He would be accompanied by a crew of animal gypsies, Winston Wolf. Three pigs, named Quiz, Chiquito, and Harpo. Percy Penguin, Pierre Lorat, Flopper Rabbit, Beethoven Bear, Samantha Skunk, Frida Frog, and Lester Lion. The park normally closed at the end of October, but for the first time in 1972, the park was open from December 26th to the 31st. All of the rides and attractions would be operational, with a new show at the Crystal Palace called Holidays. Judge Hoffines wanted the year to end with a bang, but he got more than he bargained for. On New Year's Eve, a fire erupted at the top of the Astro World Hotel. 100 guests were seen fleeing from the rooms, including the judge and his family. The flames came pouring out of the 7th floor windows and into the 8th floor, causing $150,000 in damage. The culprit was a cigarette on the 7th floor suite, but when investigators found flammable liquid at the site, the suspicion turned to arson. Hoffines would need to repair the crown jewel of his hotel complex and get it ready for the 1973 season, the park taking a break of adding something new after opening the country fair the year before. Instead, the park would be getting a facelift, new facades, new artifacts, a regilding for the Astro Needle, restoring the Denzel carousel, the water in the lagoon drained and cleaned, reworking the engines on the taxi and spin-out, 
and touching up the tram cars, the Black Dragon, and the 610 train. There would be one thing missing, the first ride to be removed from Astroworld, that being the Chance Rides the Boggin Coaster, Swamp Buggy. 1973 would also see Ruben Askenas resign his post atop the Astro Domain Corporation. He said he would only be there for a year, but stayed 18 months, helping Hoffpein secure a long-term financing program. This would be worth $38 million. The judge was appreciative of everything Askenas did for the company, and the board elected him as a new chairman. 1974 would also be void of new rides, but park management knew that wasn't their biggest draw. That would be shows. They would build a brand new stage next to Skyrama, and that would be used to present the top name entertainers coming to the park that year. This included Jose Feliciano kicking off the season on April 6, El Chicano on Cinco de Mayo, Bobby Goldsboro on Memorial Day weekend, and other name acts over the summer. Admission rising to $6.25 for adults and $5.25 for kids, and seating being on a first come first serve basis. This was a big success, as the park brought in over 1.5 million guests, and they drew some interest from one of their biggest competitors, Six Flags. They had approached Astroworld for a possible sale, the park worth somewhere between 20 and 35 million dollars. As park official William E. McDonald said, Astroworld did not hang out a for sale sign, but if someone asked me to buy this $150 chair across my desk for $1,000, I'd sell it to him. At this point, Astro Domain was having major cash flow problems. This was because of declining attendance at Astros games, and their creditors were looking to seize control. Those creditors included Ford Motor Credit, General Electric Credit, and HNC Realty. They saw Six Flags knocking, and they saw it as a great opportunity to offload operational control to an experienced company. In May of 1975, the deal was done. Astroworld was now part of the Six Flags family. They had acquired a 20-year lease, the total price of the full term approaching $50 million. Six Flags president Ned DeWitt envisioned Astroworld as providing a different experience from Six Flags over Texas. Texans and tourists will want to visit both parks because of their differences. On the Astroworld side, Astro Domain Executive Vice President Sidney Schlenker said, In this time of rising interest rates, it is necessary at times to refinance certain obligations of a corporation that has large debt. Bill Crandall would take over as general manager, coming from Six Flags over Texas and stating the park's name would not change. Astroworld will be completely different from the Six Flags in Arlington, so the people of Texas will want to visit both parks. As for Judge Roy Hoffines, he had officially lost control of the Astro Domain Empire. Although Astroworld was doing well, the facility as a whole had a very problematic financial situation, prompting the lender takeover. For the first time, neither the judge nor his family had majority control over the Astro Domain. Hoffines' three children had met a week prior, and they decided to relinquish control of their holdings. The judge was still one of three people the lenders assigned to run the operation, along with Astro Domain President T.H. Nalen and Vice President Sidney Schlenker, but they were now responsible to answer to the lenders' wishes. Between the lenders at the top and Six Flags running Astroworld, there was a new sheriff in town, and the park was about to make some drastic changes. Thanks for watching episode 2 of this 5 part documentary. If you enjoyed it, please drop a like. And if you know anyone who would be interested in the history of Astroworld, I'd appreciate if you shared this with them. This is a major project and I appreciate the support. Stay tuned next week as Six Flags begins their reign over Astroworld, and they stamp the park with their signature element, roller coasters. 